Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. My name is Tony Gallippi, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of BitPay. So I assume many of you guys have heard of us, maybe seen us, but I'm going to talk a little bit more generically today about what is it going to take to get businesses to start adopting Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is great, you can trade it, you can send it to your friends, but it's really not usable unless you can spend it somewhere, right? That's the whole point. So that's how BitPay was founded with that one mission. And whenever I give speeches, sometimes I go talk to technology groups, sometimes it's to um, corporate, uh, uh, corporate groups. But I'd like to start with this one slide and just to kind of break the ice a little bit. And if you've seen this, don't, don't spoil it for the rest of the people. But I like to ask the audience, who can tell me what's wrong with this picture? Correct. That's not Ned. That is Homer Simpson. But he has Ned Flanders' credit card, and he's going to go shopping on the internet, and he's going to do a lot of damage. So what you start to realize when you take a step back and look at what we're doing today in e-commerce, credit cards were never designed for the internet. Credit cards were designed in the 1950s and 1960s as something that you present in person. And when you present them in person, there's a lot of ways to mitigate the fraud, and it's a relatively low-risk transaction because you're dealing with somebody face-to-face. -face. When you try to use them over the internet, it's a situation called the card's not present. And there are huge risks involved in this. Number one, as a consumer, every time you fill out that whole long form with your name, your address, your zip code, the secret code on the back, you know, you run the risk of identity theft because that's all the same information that a thief would need to steal to pretend to be you. And so identity theft affects up to 10 million victims a year. And it's a problem because if you are a victim of identity theft and you think you know which store that happened at, you're probably not going to go shop there again. So it's going to affect your buying habits, even though it may not be the store's fault at all. It may have been somebody in the middle that was handling your card data. So the way credit cards were designed, every time you use it, all of your account information is exposed on every single transaction. And it's a difficult problem to secure. The flip side of this, on the receiving side, this is the business. If a business takes a credit card and ships a piece of merchandise, if it turns out that card was stolen at the time, then the, victim becomes a vi the business becomes a victim of payment fraud. So they get a charge back. You know, they are now out the money because the credit card company takes it back away from them. And they've already shipped the merchandise, so it's a total loss. This is a big problem, actually. When you look at how much this costs businesses, LexisNexis does a study every year called the True Cost of Fraud. And they survey retailers. You know, how much are you losing every year in payment fraud? And the number is high, you know, $100 billion a year. I mean, this is almost 1% of our GDP is payment fraud. So it's a huge problem. Credit cards have problems of security breaches. Again, by design, your account numbers are always exposed. And anybody that you stores your credit card so they can bill you again, well, they've got to protect that. And so it seems like, you know, every couple of months we hear a story, right? Sony PlayStation got hacked and 750,000 people's credit card numbers got out. Um, around this time last year, Global Payments, a payment processor, you know, they leaked out one and a half million credit card numbers. Um, this is a problem. And, and the one that everybody is a little bit concerned about, but nobody wants to talk about, is Apple. Who here has an Apple iTunes account? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. Okay. Apple iTunes has 400 million credit card numbers stored on file. Can you imagine just the absolute disaster that would be? Can you imagine the cost that Apple has to go through to protect that and secure it, not only from hackers, but from their own employees? 400 million people. Um, so this is a real problem, and it just goes back to the way that credit cards were designed. When you try to use them across international borders, they don't really work well that either, right? You know, the ability to authenticate somebody over the internet you know, in a foreign country you know, is a heck of a lot worse than trying to authenticate somebody over the internet in your same country. So credit cards have high fees. The whole process has been cobbled together over the last 40, 50 years. There are so many banks, and everybody has their little piece of the pie, and at the end of the day, you know, the businesses are paying a lot of money to process a transaction. So collecting a, a payment should not be as painful of a process as it is today. So we obviously think that Bitcoin is the solution. 
You know, Bitcoin was designed for the internet, and Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer payment network. So what are some of the advantages? Why would you want to use this? Well, number one, you can stop identity theft. You know, that will never happen in a Bitcoin transaction. It can't happen, because in order to spend Bitcoins, you never have to give your name or your identity, so there's nothing for a thief to steal. So there's 10 million people a year that might like what we have. You can dramatically reduce fraud. You know, if you're on the receiving end of a payment, a Bitcoin payment is irreversible. So once somebody pays you, that money is now yours and not theirs. And you can now ship your merchandise with confidence that you're not going to get the charge back in the dispute. So there's other types of fraud and theft that you have to worry about, but the, the problem of payment fraud that is the big one that, that people are worried about, that goes away. PCI compliance is also not needed for Bitcoin because, again, you're not storing any cardholder data. You're not rebilling somebody. You're never pulling money from anybody's account. So you don't have to worry about being compliant with the, the payment card industry. One of the biggest benefits with Bitcoin that we're starting to see is that companies can now monetize emerging markets. You know, they can now sell their product or service into places where they couldn't sell before. And when you talk to companies, they have a website. You know, their website can reach customers in 200 countries. That's not a problem. UPS can deliver their product to 200 countries. So that's not a problem. The problem is the payment. You know, they can't take their money. And so when you look at payment services like PayPal and Visa and MasterCard, I mean, they block half the world. So half the world is not able to buy the goods and services if you're here trying to sell it. And so companies are starting to see Bitcoin as a way to monetize the emerging markets where all the other payment networks you know, are not working. Bitcoin is also a mobile phone play. And this is going to be a really crowded space. And I'm going to talk about this. I've got a whole slide on it in a minute. But there are two things that Bitcoin can do hands down better than any other payment network. Number one, they can do internet payments across international borders like a piece of cake. There is no other payment network that can do it as easily as Bitcoin can. In the mobile space, Bitcoin is also global. You know, you can send money from your phone to somebody else's phone anywhere in the world, and it gets there instantly. And so this is really unique, and it, and it opens the door to having a true global community of commerce. You know, businesses can now do business with other businesses or consumers anywhere in the world. Just like now with email, you can communicate with anybody in the world. With Skype, you can talk to anybody in the world. Now with Bitcoin, you can transact with anybody in the world. So the peer-to-peer -peer payment network that Bitcoin is, it, it's not really that new when you start to look at the three technologies that it, brings, uh, that it brings forward. And these are three technologies that we're using every day in our daily lives, and they're growing. Number one is the cloud. Right? Everything is moving to the cloud. Your data is moving to the cloud. Your business and your software is all moving to the cloud. Well, Bitcoin is an accounting ledger in the cloud. Fundamentally, that's what it is. You know, it has no physical presence. You know, the blockchain is a, an accounting ledger in the cloud. Bitcoin also is mobile, right? Everything's going mobile nowadays. Every business wants to interact with their customers on their mobile device. Customers and consumers want to do a lot more on their mobile device. You basically have a, you know, a, a computer in your pocket that can access the internet, and you can almost do anything you need on it. The last thing is open source. You know, open source software is rapidly growing. You know, companies are not afraid to use open source software in what they're building. A lot of companies are encouraging their employees to build open source software, stuff that can benefit the community, stuff that can be released and other people can innovate and build on top of. So these are three, you know, growing trends in the world today. And Bitcoin is all three, right? Bitcoin is in the cloud. Bitcoin is fully mobile. And Bitcoin is open source. So this is the only slide I really have about BitPay, you know, what we're doing in this space. Um, you know, we, we try to make it easy to accept Bitcoin. And if companies wanted to take Bitcoin, they could do it themselves. Just like home improvement or construction, you, you can do that yourself. So, you know, maybe you hire a crew and they, they put a telephone pole in the middle of your driveway. Uh, this is a bank somewhere in the Middle East that tried to install an ATM themselves. 
there's a guy on his tiptoes trying to use it, so that didn't work out too well. Here's a guy, well, I assume it's a guy, that tried to install a bathroom faucet by himself. But if a company did want to accept Bitcoin themselves, you, know, you guys learned about it in the last session, right? This is what they would have to do. You know, they have to install and secure the software. You know, there's no automation. You have to write every line of code yourself. You know, you've got to manually calculate and, and, and convert in and out of local currency. You know, the volatility risk is a big one, right? A lot of businesses just don't like that volatility. They may be operating on very thin margins as it is, and the price swings would, would kill them. When you get into bigger companies, you know, the accountant comes into the room and he says, wait a minute, you know, what the heck is this? You know, how do I reconcile Bitcoin in my accounting system? Um, the bigger companies, they're run by lawyers and they have a whole different set of questions. You know, they don't want to get sued. They want to know, like, is this going to be compliant with the law? Or are we going to get in trouble? So you learned about this in the last session, right? There's technical risk, there's security risk, there's volatility risk, there's financial risk, there's legal risk. Companies look at this and they say, well, I understand the value, but I don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Right? Too much risk. And that's where a service like BitPay can really start to make a difference. You know, with BitPay, we take a lot of that risk off of the merchants. So they don't have to install a, a wallet on their server. They can configure an account on our system, and we have a wallet. Our system is fully automated, so every order that we process you know, we know exactly who it was for, if it's the right amount, you know, what merchant it goes to, and what we do next. Merchants can set up a direct deposit with us. This makes it really easy. So we can cash them out every single day with a direct deposit into their bank account. That's how they get paid by their credit card processor. You know, they get paid every single day for all the sales they made the day before. Our system works the same way. If they select this option, it makes the accounting really easy because we don't expose them to any volatility risk. If they ask us to collect $100, we figure out how many Bitcoins that is, we deal with the buyer. Once the buyer pays, we guarantee the business will get their $100 minus our fee. So the gross amount of their order is in dollars, the net they receive in their bank account is in dollars, the fee they pay to us is in dollars, that's all they need to account for. You know, the Bitcoins become invisible to them at that point. It makes their lawyers happy too because they never legally take possession of the Bitcoins, right? We manage all that risk for them. So when you deal with larger and larger companies, you know, this is important, right? They, they, they want to give it a try. They want to experiment with it, but they want to do it in a way that doesn't expose them to too much risk. And we have a toll-free number for people to call if they have questions. So, oh, sorry, this is a second slide on BitPay. I lied. Um, so this is basically what we've built, right? The peer-to-peer -peer network is here at the bottom. We've built a platform. You know, we've built an interface layer that sits on top of the Bitcoin network that, that does all of our automated invoicing system. On top of that, we've built both an API and then a simple, you know, browser form post. And on top of that, we've made even more libraries and user-friendly features so that somebody could use one of our tools, not have to write any code. You know, if they're using a WordPress website or a Magento uh, you know, web store, they can install our gateway, configure it, and then it would appear as a, another payment option right on their checkout page. So we're trying to make it as easy as we can. Um, this is one thing that, that we run into, and I know you guys talked about it before, but you know, merchants are, are concerned about you know, being able to process transactions, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong with a Bitcoin transaction that you don't have with credit cards. So you know, one of the things that we're concerned about is just we have to be compatible with all the different wallets that are out there. Um, some, there is a standard that the Bitcoin wallets use to talk to each other, you know, and we follow that standard, but unfortunately not all of them do. So one of the things that we really like to see is that a wallet would, you know, give the user the control of their private keys, let the user, you know, compose and send the transaction on demand, you know, whenever they need to. Let the user back up their private key, so if your service goes down, they can immediately bring it into another piece of software and spend their money. You know, this is one of the beauties of Bitcoin, you know, is that if you control your private key, you can actually put that private key into three different Bitcoin wallets. And if any one of them were to go down, that's great. You can actually spend it from one of them that is up. And you can't do that with money in a bank, right? If you put your money in Chase and the Chase ATM doesn't work, well, you're not going to be able to immediately spend your money out of Bank of America. So there are a lot of things with Bitcoin that, that are attractive um, to business and businesses and customers. Um, you know, one of the things that we've built is we made it probably make it really easy to 
pre-compose a send Bitcoin transaction, right? Bitcoin has a URI. You know, it kind of works like a mail to. If you go to a website and you click like a mail to link, you know, it pops up whatever email your service and kind of pre-composes it for you. Well, Bitcoin does that too, and we support that, and it makes it really easy, you know, when you want to try to try to go shopping. So we're trying to implement all the features that we can to make, you know, it as easy as we can for the merchants and the customers to try to minimize mistakes. Um, you'd be surprised how many people can't send the right amount to the right address. It, it seems simple, but sometimes they can't do it. Sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes whatever wallet they're using just rounds it or truncates it or does something wrong. Um, so we do publish a list of the wallets on our website that we've tested that we know are compatible, um, that meet all these criteria, and, and that users can you know, always take a look at this. So when we talk about merchant adoption, there's really two areas that we want to focus on. Number one is e-commerce, right? We, we can solve the card not present fraud problem for businesses. But the other one we want to go after is retail, right? People spend money in retail, and they'd like to be able to use bitcoins when they go shopping, especially if they travel internationally. So let's talk about the first one, right? We talked about the pains in e-commerce the companies are feeling today. They're getting hit with the card not present fraud. They're getting hit with the high interchange fees. And then you also have the issue with friendly fraud. You know, this is where a buyer tries to pull a scam. So a buyer may buy something from you as a seller. Let's say they buy it from, from you and you have it listed on eBay. So they use PayPal. Um, <clears throat> you ship them, let's say, a, a $1,000 computer. The guy gets the $1,000 computer, snaps a picture of a box of telephone books, sends an email to PayPal, said, hey, this guy didn't send me a computer. He sent me a box of telephone books. I want my money back. You know, you as the seller have no protection in that. So it's become really difficult to, to do business over the internet with people that you don't know and people that you don't trust. So the solution here is actually pretty straightforward. You know, Bitcoin is a software only gateway. So we can make it work similar to PayPal and Authorize.net and all the other software, you know, payment systems that websites use. This can either be something that a business would host themselves or, you know, they can use a, a a software as a service to host it. So we think that the majority of the early adoption for Bitcoin is going to be in e-commerce, right? Because this is where all the pain is today. You know, when you're in a retail store, there's not a whole lot of problems. You have 20 different ways that you can pay in person, and most of those ways have very little risk and relatively low cost. It's on the internet where your options are very limited, and the ones you do have aren't that great. Let's talk about retail adoption. If we want to try to get Bitcoin to be able to be spent in more retail places, now this is where you got to interface with some hardware. So maybe the retailer is using something like this. How do you add Bitcoin to that? Um, maybe they're using something more modern like this. You could probably find a way to get Bitcoin integrated into that um, point of sale. More than likely, they're using something like this. Right? It's, a, it's a big mess. You, you got a computer, you got a cash drawer, uh, you got a terminal, you got a magnetic stripe reader, you got a debit pin pad, you got a scanner, you got a printer. Um, this is what you see in, in every retail checkout, right? You know, so how do you add Bitcoin to this? <laughs> um, it, it's not easy. You know, even if you could write the software to do it, you know, businesses are gonna, not going to want to spend the time, right? It's going to be possibly a hardware upgrade. They have to train their employees. It, it's a lot of work. But I think a lot of people are thinking that mobile is going to be the solution to this. However they do it, customers are going to want to come in and they're going to want to pay from their smartphones. Right? So all these retail terminals and point of sale are going to have to find some way to interface with a customer's smartphone. So here's the landscape today. There's over 100 different mobile wallets out there. I was surprised when I actually looked at the list. You've got technology companies, right? things like Google Wallet and Square. You've got banks. They have their own. Bank of America has a mobile app. You know, Visa's making a, a little mobile wallet. Chase has theirs. Every bank has theirs, right? The telecom companies, they're trying to get into the space too, right? Both um, here and, and, uh, and in Europe. And then the retailers, they're saying, well, we want to talk to our customers directly. We can build an app, and so we want to make our own mobile wallet. And so Target, Walmart, even Starbucks has one. I don't know if anybody has ever used the little Starbucks prepaid thing, but, but it works. But every single one of these wallets has the same problem. Actually, they have two problems. Number one, none of them talk to each other. They're all walled gardens. 
The second problem is none of them work internationally. I could have all 10 of these apps on my phone. If I travel to Europe, not a single one of them does me any good. Right? So this is a problem. And if you're a retailer, you've got 100 different companies coming at you saying, add my thing, add my thing, add my thing. And at some point, you're just going to throw up your hands and say, forget it. Right? We're not going to do any of them because you, know, you guys are all different and you need to get your act together. So <clears throat> we've done something pretty innovative to try to bring Bitcoin into the retail area. And, and instead of trying to replace hardware and compete in that space, we're kind of going around it. So the question is, how can you easily convert Bitcoin into a merchant's own currency? Right? Every retailer loves one form of payment above and beyond everything else. It's not credit cards. It's not even cash, because they have to pay employees to count the cash and, and transport it. Right? What is, who, who knows? Like, what is the, the favorite tender that every retailer loves to accept more than anything else? Yeah. No, not cash, actually. Exactly. It's their store credit. <laughs> you know, I want to return something. Would you like some store credit? Yes, I would. Um, and, and because companies know if they give you store credit, probably you're going to go back and spend that credit. You're going to spend two to three times the value of that credit. So they want it to be more circulated. They want you to come in the store and spend it. So this is interesting. Um, merchants love the store credit so much that they let people resell it and they give them a discount on that store credit. We've come up with a way to be able to let you pay for store credit with Bitcoins. And we've done this in partnership with Gift. And Vinny from Gift is right here in the audience. So this was announced last week, and I don't know if anybody has tried this, but the way it works, you know, Gift has a mobile app. It works on Android, it works on iOS. And it started out as an app where you can take all your plastic gift cards and just consolidate them. You know, type in the number into the app, and the app would store your card for you. So you didn't have to carry the plastic around anymore. It worked better. And it also worked better because you can immediately see the value that was left on the card. You know, you can't do that with a piece of plastic. So now you can throw these pieces of plastic away and you can carry around the app. What's interesting is that they recently made the ability to actually make a purchase within the app. So now you can buy any of these gift cards that you have from within the app. And on the Android uh, platform, they made it so you can buy the purchase in the app with Bitcoin. So we did this as a demo. Um, Crystal, who works in our office, she said, hey, all the guys want a coffee maker. So she went to Crate and Barrel, and she found this coffee maker. And everybody said, yeah, that's the one we want. So she texted me, and, and she said, hey, I, I need some money to pay for this. Well, you know, she didn't have my credit card because we weren't around. Um, and so what happened is, where is it here? So I went into my Android phone, into the Gift app. And I said, uh, I want to send a, a gift to Crystal. So I selected Crate and Barrel. I said, hey, it's $250. So after you click the $250, it shows you, hey, you, you want to send a gift to Crystal Campbell for $250. You can attach a message. You can attach a video. You know, I didn't do that because I was just sitting on a beach like all CEOs do, and I didn't really want her to know that. Um, so then this is the confirmation screen. right? Within the app, um, you know, I can pay with Bitcoin. And when I do that, within the app now, it pops up a BitPay invoice. And so it, it gives me a conversion, $250. Oh, gee, that's really hard to see. Well, $250 is a certain number of Bitcoins, and there's a timer and an address that I have to send it to. Um, what's easy now is I can just click on that URI link in the middle of the screen. It'll open up my wallet that's on my Android phone and pre-compose the transaction for me. You know, it inserts the address where it's supposed to go. It inserts the amount where it's supposed to go. Then all I have to do is hit the Send button. So that's what I do. And it says, OK, congratulations, you've sent a gift to Crystal. Now, on Crystal's phone, you know, her app beats, beeps and lets her know that he got, she got one. You, you have a new gift from Tony Gallippi. Congratulations. So she opens it up. She sees it's $250. Now she goes and spends it at the store. So this entire process took about 60 seconds from the time I bought the gift card with bitcoins to the time that it was delivered to the phone where she could walk up to the cashier and pay for the item. So immediately, what we've done between Gift and BitPay were two companies with around 20 employees, maybe around $2 million in funding collectively before last week. Um, we've done what all 100 of those mobile wallet companies have not been able to do you know, with all the millions of dollars that they spent, right? What kind of retail penetration have they gotten? Not much, 
right? We, we've been able to do this, and we've been able to do it just by thinking out of the box. Um, with the update that GIFT announced, announced today, this is a screenshot, but you can now buy any of the GIFT cards in their network from any browser, including a mobile browser. So you don't have to do it from within the app anymore. So has any, did anybody actually try this after the news came out? A couple people did, okay. You bought a what? <laughs> you know what? I did the same thing. I went out to the store and I said, I want to do this because this is so neat. And I actually bought a, a, an Android Galaxy 3 and, and uh, it was great. So yeah, it, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, so we're going we're gonna to see how this takes off. Um, you know, again, the merchants love store credit. This is a way to get more people into it. It's a way to give people more opportunities to spend their Bitcoins, which is the whole point of a currency is to have places where you can spend it. Um, so right now, just to give you some numbers, we have over 7,000 businesses using our platform to accept Bitcoin payments. Uh, we're signing up about 100 new merchants a day. And a couple of categories, we talked about the whole international market, but exporters, you know, they have a lot of pain today. And so we see a lot of them coming to our service and a lot of them want to accept Bitcoin. Crowdfunding, micropayments, this is a popular category that we see I'd probably say the most popular category of all is what I would just collectively call IT services, right? Anything that you would need to set up, operate, you know, build, create a website, you know, or a web-based business. So we have a blog. Every once in a while, we'll, we'll post a, a new story about a new merchant that comes up. The last thing I want to talk about is the regulation. And this is a question that every single merchant keeps asking, and especially since it's been in the news a lot. Well, how is Bitcoin going to comply with the regulations? And I said, well, I don't know. We're living in an era where none of us were around 100 years ago, but if we were, you know, there were all types of rules and regulations around transportation that were all written around horse and buggies. And then automobiles were invented. And of course, you can't take all the rules that were designed for horse and buggies and expect them to work when we now have automobiles. You, know, you have to look at the automobile for what it can do and how people can use it and what its capabilities are, and you have to come up with a new set of rules for for the new technology. So I, I don't know what regulators are going to do. I mean, clearly, Bitcoin does not fit any of the categories that they've already defined, right? It's, it's really not a currency. When you look at it, it's more of a commodity. But it's actually a virtual commodity. It's nothing physical that you can actually hold. It's, it's a virtual commodity with no physical presence. Um, but really, it's just an accounting ledger and an accounting system in the cloud. Um, so how do you regulate something like that? I don't know what they're going to do. Um, but when I met with them, I said, well, how would you regulate anything that is open source? Forget the fact of what it is, right? Just how would you regulate anything that's open source? And then number two, how do you regulate anything that is peer-to-peer, -peer, that people can trade amongst themselves? So forget the fact that it's money, right? Pretend that it's a, a music file that people can share peer-to-peer. -peer. How do you regulate that? Um, so I, I think the regulators are going to have a hard time, you know, trying to, to come up with this. And so they're better off just you know, scrapping all the rules they have, quite honestly, and taking a look at Bitcoin, what its capabilities are, how people are using it, and coming up with a whole new set of rules. But if you were to actually do the thought exercise and figure out, well, if they were to try to come up with some rules for it, what would they do? The only thing I can come up with is they could regulate it like they regulate casinos. Meaning you as a customer, when you go into a casino, you get chips. And you can do whatever the heck you want with these chips. You can bet, you can trade them. You know, nobody, none of those are really tracked. You know, and I can actually take a big pile of chips. I can take $100,000 worth of poker chips you know, and give it to Marty. Nobody in the world would ever know about that. All right? Marty can go to Vegas. He can spend it on hotels and restaurants and whatever he wants to spend it on. Nobody would ask him any questions. But if he ever went to the cashier's desk and wanted to cash out, hundred grand worth of poker chips. Well, you better believe he's going to sign some papers and, and show some ID. So I, I think that's the only way that really you could do it is to try to monitor the entry and exit points when you get in and out of Bitcoin above a certain dollar amount, you know, throw some compliance in there. But, you know, within Bitcoin, there's just no possible way to regulate, you know, anything that's going peer to peer over the Bitcoin network. It's just not there. So that's all that I had. I, I wanted to open it up to see if you guys had any questions. Yes. I took, I took the microphone. Sorry, I'll have to come talk to you. Dan Daskalescu with Blue Seed. 
My question is, uh, have you considered intermediating investments? I believe there are a bunch of startups that would love to get investments, but as everybody here knows, the SEC requires investors to be accredited, you cannot publicly announce, and many investors would like to invest Bitcoins directly. So I was wondering if you had the plans to tackle that problem. That's a good one. So, I mean, we believe that crowdfunding is probably the future of the software industry and probably the future of, of any type of business. Um, the issue that you face is, you know, how can you sell equity, you know, in, in a regulated manner? It, it's not the fact that you're using Bitcoins. It's the fact of what you're selling that's regulated. If, if I'm selling tobacco, then it doesn't matter if I take Bitcoins. I'm selling tobacco and I have to follow the rules that apply when I sell tobacco. So it would be interesting to see what some of the new regulations are. I mean, Obama passed the Jobs Act, which supposedly is going to make it easier for companies to crowdfund and be able to give small amounts, and you don't have to be an accredited investor. Um, we actually have a, a, a new um, program in our state of Georgia where if you are a Georgia resident, you can invest in a Georgia company up to $1,000 without being an accredited investor. And so there's a lot of opportunities there for innovation that I think other states would do. But I think, you know, I don't know what the SEC is going to do. I think they're probably going to leave it to the states. And, and if states want to try to do something like they did in Georgia to let more people invest in it with their friends and family, you know, for, for new startups that they want to see fit, I, I, think, I think that's a good thing. Yes. Hi. So uh, obviously, we, we all want to see uh, broader merchant acceptance, and we all think what you're doing is excellent. Um, so that's that is terrific. The the question in my mind is relative to what the the credit card companies were able to do when they were trying to drive acceptance by sort of literally stuffing dollars in in merchants' pockets. What can the Bitcoin community do besides saying, "Hey, we want you to take Bitcoin"? in terms of providing merchants with sort of direct financial incentives the way that the, the credit card companies did to drive Bitcoin acceptance. And I mean, that would obviously be good for your business, right? Yeah, and you kind of touch on another problem, which is the chicken and the egg problem, right? Businesses look at it and say, well, it's great, but nobody's asking for this. And we have 20 other things that we've got to be doing, and why would I waste my time doing this when, when nobody is really asking for it, right? It's not one of our top 10 or 20 priorities. So I think it, it, Bitcoin is not ready for every type of business just yet. But I think for businesses that have the most pain, you know, if they're selling internationally, if they're selling a high ticket item, if they're selling over the internet, well, if you do any one of those three things, you've got a reason to try Bitcoin. If you're doing two or all three of those, then holy cow, you need to be doing this right now. Um, but, but I think, you know, one of the things that you can do for the merchants, you know, that we've talked to, they really like the fraud mitigation. And I think if they understand how this is a, a more reliable, lower risk method of, of receiving a payment, you know, I, I think they'll give it a try. And so it can't hurt to have customers constantly request businesses to, you know, hey, you know, will you take my money? Um, you know, there's over $1.3 billion worth of Bitcoins out there, right? What business wouldn't want to take some of that money? Um, when we first started, you know, it, the value proposition was there, but they didn't know how, right? And so now there are services. We're not the only one. There are other people that are trying to do it. But yeah, I mean, having consumers just constantly remind them and ask them, I think, is, is a way to do it. Okay, we have a little promotion here. Um, we're going to be like Oprah. Come, come up with me. Okay. All right. <laughs> Oprah. Oprah. All right, you get a shirt, and you get a shirt. <laughs> Where's the rest of them? <laughs> All right, help me pass them out. All right, who wants a shirt? You get a shirt, and you get a shirt. <laughs> oh. Actually, the other side is being neglected, so let's go over there. Let's go over the other side. All right, uh, got to run over here. Yeah. All right, you get a shirt, and you get a shirt. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>